So we've already talked about extrema and finding uh, relative or local extrema uh, as well as saddle points. Uh, but we also need to talk about absolute extrema. Now, not absolute extrema necessarily on a surface as a whole, but absolute extrema on a surface that lies within a particular constraint or a subset of the plane. And this whole process is something that we call Lagrange multipliers. So here are two surfaces, okay? And on each of these surfaces, uh, we could talk about um, relative max or min, or even absolute max and min on the surface. So if you look at a couple of points here, let's say maybe this point here, this point here, those would be considered uh, local maximums. They also might be absolute maximums, depending on how high they go. It looks like this one is a little bit higher than the other one and therefore this one would be the global or absolute maximum. You also see right about here we got a saddle point. Okay, So these are all the things we would have found previously. Now, let's switch it up a little bit. Let's look at a random point on the side of this surface. So if I look at this point right here. Now that point right here on the side of the surface is just this random point. Okay, But Let's look at it relative to this curve. So if I have this curve that sits uh, in the xy plane here, okay, and I project this curve up onto the surface, okay, what's going to happen is I'm going to get this curve on the surface. So as if like I shine a light from below here and then I project it up onto the surface. Or if I create a cylinder, okay. If I create a cylinder here, so I have a curve that just has X's and Y's in it, okay? But when we throw a curve that has X's and Y's in it, we call it a cylindric surface. So it creates this cylindric surface here, and that cylindric surface will intersect this random surface on this curve. Now, if I was stuck to only being able to travel along this curve, right? So I'm a particle that's traveling along this curve uh, on the surface. So I couldn't travel over here or over here or even up to this peak over here. I was only allowed to travel along this curve on the surface. I could ask, when would I hit the maximum possible height on the surface while also on this curve? And this is the concept of this Lagrange multipliers. Trying to find extreme values on a function or on a surface but constrained in some subset of the planes, constrained to being only allowed to travel along the curve. In which case I would say the maximum I could reach, and it's the absolute maximum I could reach on this uh, surface while staying on the curve, is that point right there. And it looks like maybe there's a minimum maybe here, unless this goes horizontal right here, in which case all these points would be the minimum. But we definitely have a maximum right there. And we're talking absolute, right? We're not talking about relative uh, maximum. We're, we're talking about absolute maximum here. And so that would be the highest point. If I look at this plane over here on this side, okay? Again, this plane, remember, doesn't have edges to it, right? This plane will continue to go in all directions. Uh, we just draw it with these edges so you can kind of see the surface better. And the same thing here with this one here. This doesn't actually have this edge right here. This surface would continue going down further and further. But anyway, this plane itself doesn't have any maximums or minimums, relative or absolute. But if I stick this curve in the xy plane and I create the cylindric surface, basically projecting it up onto this plane, and the only place on the plane I could travel would be along this curve, then clearly there is a maximum I would reach up on the surface, I would be able to get to the surface to the highest point on the surface and stop and then eventually come back down. And I would actually have a minimum down here as well. Okay, And that would be an absolute max and an absolute min on the surface but stuck on this particular constraint curve. Again, this whole concept is what we call Lagrange multipliers. And this is not very different uh, than maybe some of the things maybe you saw in Calc 1. Think about some of the um, optimization problems that you dealt with in Calc 1. One of the most common ones was the box question. 
So it was, you had a certain amount of cardboard, okay? So let's say you had 100 square feet of cardboard, and you had to construct a box that had the maximum volume. Well, that's essentially saying you're trying to find a maximum, but you have a constraint. You only have 100 square feet of cardboard. So it, it falls into the same general category as that, but this is now in a multivariable scenario. But you can see how it, it could be a similar idea where we're trying to find a maximum or a minimum, but we're stuck within a constraint on the surface. I'll give you one more scenario here just to hit this home one more time. Let's go back to this surface here. Um, and let's say my curve in the XY plane maybe looks like this. Okay, It doesn't have to be a loop. So that's why I'm giving you this example. Both of those examples, kind of the curve was like this loop, this closed curve. And so when I project this up, I'm going to get something maybe like this, okay, go onto the surface. Okay, so this projected up onto the surface would give me this picture. Now, if I was traveling only on this curve, I was a particle that was only allowed to travel along this curve up on the surface, I would reach a maximum right there. You would say maybe I'd have a minimum there, I'd have another maximum there, I'd have a minimum there, I'd have a maximum there, but they're all relative. So the question that we're looking for is not necessarily all these little bumps uh, and the relatives, but the absolute. In this case, there's the absolute. Why is that one the absolute maximum compared to maybe this one or this one? Because it reaches the highest point on the surface, in which the z value for this is bigger than any of these other z values. And that's going to be an important idea of how we're going to go through this Lagrange multipliers. And these are just relative minimums, but neither of them are absolute minimums because this just keeps going down and down and down along the surface, which also continues down. And so there would be no absolute minimum, but there definitely would be this one absolute maximum. But we'd also find some of these other points here in the mix as well, none of which are really what we're looking for necessarily. Um, so just another kind of picture that could describe what we're going to be doing here. Okay, so if we try and flatten this down now and look at it, the surface as level curves instead of the 3D model that I just gave you. So remember, what are we trying to do? Okay, We're trying to find extrema on some function subject to a constraint curve. Now, that constraint curve is really sitting in the XY plane, um, but you could think of it as a cylindric surface as there is no z value and therefore the whole curve in the xy plane would be then drug vertically along the z axis. But if you notice this g of xy only has x's and y's in it and we wrote it in this um, implicit form of that g of xy equals zero. But the function is a surface, it's a 3D surface f of xy. All right. So we want to increase and decrease along f of x to y while also remaining on the curve. Now remember, the gradient is going to point us in the direction of maximum increase. So the gradient is going to be pointing us up the surface. So if we're going to be on the curve, we want to be traveling in the direction of the gradient. Or you could say you want to also travel in the opposite direction of the gradient so you can find that minimum. But we want to move in the gradient's direction, but we remember we have to stay on the curve. So we can't always necessarily just go directly in the direction of the gradient. We want to go in the direction of the gradient while staying on the curve. So if you look at, say, this picture here, here's the constraint curve. All these are the level surface, level curves of the surface. And so the gradient's pointing this direction. But if I start going this way here, I'm going to come off of the curve. So I have to be staying on the curve, but always traveling in this direction, in the direction here. So I can't come off the curve and start going here. I have to stay on the curve, and i got to start looking at the gradients. Well, there's a bunch of gradients here, and they're all going to be pointing basically up the mountain. So as I'm traveling along here, I'm f trying to follow that general direction. So once I get to here, all right, I, I'm going to look at the next gradient, which is pointing in this direction. So I'm going to keep going, keep going. And then I get to this point right about here. When I get to right about here, I've kind of traveled as far up the surface as possible. If you notice, this level right here is a 2. This level down here is a 1. And so once I reach that point, let me erase it so you can see it now better. Okay. Once I reach this point right here, 
I've gotten as far up the surface as possible because I've gotten to level two. And once I pass there, I'm going to start coming back down the surface, right? So that clearly is that highest point on the surface. Now, what does that have in common with the gradient? Okay? So remember, the gradient points in the direction you want to start moving, right? But we can't necessarily just move off the curve and follow the gradient all the way up. But we don't fall and fall in that direction. So what happens is we want to keep moving along the curve until the gradient becomes orthogonal to the constraint curve. So the idea here is if I look at this point here and I create a tangent line right there at P, the gradient will be perpendicular to the, the tangent line. Or, more importantly, what we could say is that the gradient of F is actually going to be parallel to the gradient of G because the gradient of this curve here okay, will also be orthogonal to the tangent plane. So what we're really looking for is when are these two gradients going to be orthogonal to one another, okay? Have meet in a 90 degree angle. Uh, sorry, when these two gradients are parallel to each other, uh, the tangent line, they're both orthogonal to the tangent line. Because if you think about it here, this gradient here, um, let me give you another picture here. If I'm going to draw the gradient to the curve, the gradient to the curve will always be orthogonal to the tangent line to the curve. So there's another gradient, there's another gradient, uh, there's another gradient. So the gradient to the constraint curve is going to look like that, whereas the gradient to the surface is going to be pointing up the surface like this. So you see right here, right here is where the two gradients become parallel. Um, and that means they're both pointing straight up the mountain, essentially. And so we're looking at when are the two gradients parallel. Well, if they're parallel, that means one is a multiple of the other. Remember, this is a vector and this is a vector. So if they're parallel, one's just a multiple of the other, and that multiple we'll call lambda. And lambda is this Lagrange multiplier that uh, we're going to find. And ultimately, really, we don't care what this Lagrange multiplier is, and you'll see this. What we care about is which x's and y's will make this happen, not so much which lambda will make this happen, although we will find lambda in the process. Uh, the lambda is not as important. We want to find the actual point where this occurs. But the way we're going to do this is by finding when these two gradients, the gradient to the surface and the gradient to the constraint curve, are parallel. And so we have to solve for that. Okay, so let's assume that f of x, y, and g of x, y are differentiable functions. f of x, y is the surface, so it's really a three-variable uh, equation in that z is the dependent, f of x and y are the independents. That's your surface. g of x, y is, remember, equal to zero. That's the two-variable equation. That is the constraint curve. If f of x, y is a local minimum or maximum on the constraint curve, uh, g of x, y equals zero at some particular point, a, B, and if the gradient of G does not equal zero, so that's a pretty important one, we got to make sure that the gradient of G at this point doesn't equal zero, then there is a scalar, lambda, such that the gradient of F will equal lambda times the gradient of G. And basically what we're looking for are these points where this is going to occur. And ultimately, once we find those points, then we want to figure out which one of those points ends up being the absolute maximum or absolute minimum. And so when we go through our process of how we're going to do this, you'll see why the last step is going to help us answer that part. But anyway, uh, the point AB that we're looking for that satisfies this Lagrange equation uh, is called the critical point. Um, and uh, F of AB, okay, which is then the Z value that's attached to AB, so f of the AB would be the z value, so that's going to tell us how high we're going to get on the surface, is called the critical value. So the way we're going to do this is done with a couple of fairly um, simple steps. And they, I mean, simple in theory, but the difficult is the actual com computation. But anyway, we're going to optimize again f of x, y subject to the screen g of x, y equals 0.
So generally, this is the method that we're going to use. Now, this doesn't work all the time, but generally, this is what we're going to look at. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to have to set the gradients equal to each other. Well, if the gradients are equal to each other, okay, if the gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g, then these are two vectors. Well, if two vectors are going to be equal to each other, then the components are going to have to be equal to each other. So the first component of f, which is f with respect to x, has to equal lambda times g with respect to x. Then the second component of each vector will have to be equal to each other. So f with respect to y has to equal lambda times g with respect to y. Now remember, we also need to make sure we always stay on the constraint curve. So we need this third equation here, which is our constraint curve, to also be part of this system of equations. And ultimately what we're doing is creating a system of equations where there are three variables in our system. There is x, there's y, and there's lambda. And so since we have three variables, that's another reason why this three equations is going to be needed. So we need this third one, which is the constraint curve, because we always have to make sure we stay on that. So x and y have to satisfy that constraint curve the entire time. So in most cases, what we're going to do is we're going to take this system by first solving for lambda in terms of x and y in the first two equations. So in the first two equations, solve for lambda, and you're going to get them in terms of x and y. Well, the lambda in the first equation is the same lambda as in the second equation, so what we'll do is we'll set them equal to each other once we solve for lambda in each case, and then we'll use that to help us solve for x and y. Uh, and by plugging those into the constraint equation. Once we have that, the next step is to say, all right, well, we have all those local extrema from the um, gradient of f equaling lambda times the gradient of g. So then what we're going to do is... Um, evaluate the function at all the critical points found in the previous step. So what we're going to do is find the z value for all the points that satisfy this. Okay? So all the points that satisfy this system, we need to plug into the function and find the z value attached to each one of those points. Once we find the z value attached to all those points, the one with the largest z value will be our maximum. And the one with the smallest z value will be our minimum. And it's that idea of, okay, I have a couple of points here. Here's a local max, here's a local max, here's a local max. But this one has the highest z of all of them. Therefore, this one will be the absolute, which is what we're really looking for. And so that's really the process of how we're going to do this. So you'll see this when we do it with a particular example here. Okay, so here we want to find the extreme values on f of x, y uh, equals x times y subject to uh, this constraint. So to do this, what we want to do is first find the gradient of f and the gradient of g. So to do that, and then once we do that, what we're going to do is, uh, let me rewrite this. Once we find the gradient of f, we're going to set it equal to lambda times the gradient of g. Okay. So the gradient of f, we need f with respect to x and f with respect to y. So f with respect to x is going to be just y, and f with respect to y is going to be just x. Uh, g, we need the g with respect to x and g with respect to y. Now remember, here's g, and typically to do this, we should really set this equal to zero uh, to find the proper derivative. This is an implicit equation. So I'll write as x squared over 8 plus y squared over 2 minus 1 equals zero. Now the fact that it was just a 1 and we moved it over really doesn't make a difference because when we take the derivative, it's going to be zero regardless of the variable. But let's say that maybe there were some variables over here on this side. Then you want to dump it all over so we can find this g function's derivatives properly. So anyway, 
g with respect to x is going to be um, x over 4. g with respect to y is going to just be y. And so if we're trying to find uh, this, right, then really what we have is fx, fy is equal to lambda times gx, gy, which ultimately is this should be distributed in here, and then if they're going to be equal, the components should be equal. So we want to find where fx equals lambda gx, fy equals lambda gy, and then remember we also have to make sure we always stay on this constraint curve. So then this is the system we're going to create based off of these pieces we have here. So we'll have that y equals lambda x over 4, x equals lambda y, and x squared over 8 plus y squared over 2 equals 1. Okay? So there's our system. So what we're going to try and do, and this is going to be the path that we'll try in most cases, but this doesn't always work, and we'll see an example where it starts to fall apart. But we're going to try and solve both of these for lambda, which is pretty easy to do. So I'll get lambda equals 4y over x and lambda equals um, x over y, in which case if these are both what lambda equals, these should equal each other. So 4y over x equals x over y, cross multiply, you get 4y squared equals x squared. And we could solve for either x or y here at this point, but it's actually not necessary because then what we're going to do is where we get from here, we're going to plug into the constraint equation. Well, there's an x squared here already, so there's no reason for me to really solve for x. So if I plug that into the constraint equation, what I end up with is 4y squared over 8 plus y squared over 2 equals 1. So I'm just solving a system of equations here, basically by a series of substitution, where I substitute one equation into the other, into the third one. So eventually I can whittle it down to something that's solvable with a single variable, which I have here. So if you look at this, this is really y squared over 2. If you simplify it, here's y squared over 2, which ultimately would just give me y squared equals 1. So y equals plus and minus 1. So I have a y. Okay. Remember, I'm looking for the point that would basically satisfy this while also on the constraint curve. So the point x and y that satisfies all this at once. So I have the y, so now what I need to do is figure out what the x is. Well, now I'll just work my way backwards. So then I'll take this, and I'll go back to here. So if 4y squared equals x squared, and y equals 1, then 4 times 1 equals x squared, and so therefore x equals plus and minus 2. So right, I, what I have right now are two critical points here. I have 2, 1, and negative 2, 1, okay? This one y value, but it gave me two x's. Also, if, let's get rid of some of these arrows here, make more space. If y equals negative 1, um, with this 4y squared equals x squared, then I get 4 times negative 1 squared, which is still 1, equals x squared. So x equals plus or minus 2 again. But those are actually two other points. So I have 2, negative 1, and negative 2, negative 1. All right, so what I ended up getting is 4 of these points, right? 4 of these critical points. And so what I need to do now is say, okay, these are all these possible local max and mins that are on the constraint curve. There's all the places where essentially the two gradients will be equal to each other along the constraint curve um, and the surface. But which one reaches the highest point on the surface? Which one reaches the lowest point on the surface? So what I want to do is I want to go back to my surface, which was f of x, y equals x times y. And I want to x times y. 
and I want to evaluate each one of these points in that function. So f of 2, negative 1, f of negative 2, negative 1, f of 2, 1, f of negative 2, 1. Okay? And I want to find what the z value is, what the function value is for each one of these points. Well, if I'm plugging them into here, it's pretty easy. This will be negative 2, this will be 2, this will be 2, this will be negative 2. And so what happens is these two have the exact same z value. These two reach the exact same highest point on the surface, and these two reach the same lowest point. So in which case, these two will be my maximum on the surface, and these two here will be my minimum. So we have an absolute max at, uh, was it, negative 2, negative 1, uh, 2, and a minimum at, uh, oh, sorry, another minimum at, that was a maximum. Uh, I reversed it. So a minimum at the negative 2 is a min, so we would have 2, negative 1, negative 2, and the other one with the negative 2 is this negative 2, 1, negative 2, and we'd have two maxes, okay? Two maxes at uh, negative 2, negative 1, 2, and 2, 1, 2. So to give you a further interpretation of what we just did, both of these represent the surface f of x, y equals x times y. Okay? And the constraint curve, which was x squared over 8 plus y squared over 2 equals 1, is an ellipse. It's an ellipse centered at the origin. Okay? So if your x, y plane is essentially sitting right here, uh, you have an ellipse centered at the origin, okay? which is going to look something like this, possibly. All right? And what you see is you're going to get two maxima. When this curve here is projected up onto the surface, you're going to get this curve that does something like this. It kind of curves down and then goes like this. Right? So you're going to get these two maximums up here on these sides, and you'll get the two minimums. This one, it's hard to see, but this one will be back here because uh, it will loop back around that way. But then you have these two minimums here easier to see it when you do it in the um, level curves picture. So if you think about putting a, um, an ellipse I don't know, along here, like this, here and here would be your two um, maximum or minimums, and here would be your two uh, other two maximum minimums. So you can see where we would get this picture um, as our two, these would be equal pieces and these would be equal pieces here um, on the surface. So it would look like um, these two should be your two maximums and these two would be your two minimums on the surface. Here's another example. Um, different function, different constraint curve, but same idea. Okay, here's the function. Find the extreme values of this function on this cylinder, so subject to this constraint here. Uh, this is the unit circle, but it's really a cylinder if you look at it in terms of Z uh, and a cylindric surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to find Fx and Fy. Okay. In this case, we'll get 2x and we'll get 4y. We're going to look at Gx and Gy. Uh, again, this should be set equal to zero, but the fact that the 1 moved over is not really going to make a difference. So 2x, 2y, because the derivative of the 1 will always be zero. And so then what we're doing here is we want to find where fx equals lambda gx, fy equals lambda gy, and we want to always make sure we stay on the constraint curve the whole time. Okay. We have to be on that constraint curve. Um, we can't set the surface as our third piece to this system because we can't be anywhere on the surface. We can only stay on one specific spot on the surface, and that's the spot is where the constraint curve is. So anyway, what we get here is 2x equals lambda uh, 2x. Uh, 
4y equals lambda 2y and x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now if we try and do this one the same way that we did the last one, we get a little bit of a problem because if I solve this for lambda, um, I'm going to get that lambda equals 2x over 2x, which you might say is 1. And if I did the same thing here, I would get lambda equals 4y over 2y, so then lambda equals 2. And then if I try and set those equal to each other, I get 2 equals 1. Well, that's not the case, and that does nothing for me. And so this kind of breaks down sometimes when we, we try this practice. So we're going to do something a little bit differently. Remember, we're solving a system, and what we're ultimately doing is a series of substitutions to get down to a single variable. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this differently. I'm not going to divide by 2x. And the reason why that fell apart, the reason why this fell apart, and I take 2x and 2x, and I cancel these and I get 1, um, is uh, a problem here is because um, when I'm dividing by the 2x, I'm basically assuming x can't be 0, right? And when I'm canceling these out, I'm sort of getting an issue with that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to simplify this by subtracting the 2x to the other side. So I get 0 equals lambda 2x times uh, minus 2x. Then I'm going to factor out the 2x, and I'm going to get 2x times lambda minus 1. Remember, this equals 0, so ultimately either this equals 0 or this equals 0. So it's going to tell me x equals 0 or lambda equals 1, which is what I had before. Remember, I had the lambda equals 1, but I lost this. I lost the x equals 0. So now I see the x could be equal to 0. Then I'm going to use this and substitute it into one of these other two equations that are left. So if x equals 0 and I try and substitute it into this equation, it does nothing for me. There's no x's there. But if I substitute that into this equation, it'll help me find y. So I'm going to use that. So if x equals 0 using x squared plus y squared equals 1, I'm going to find that y squared equals 1. So y equals plus and minus 1. So that gives me 0, 1, and 0, negative 1 as two solutions. All right, but I also have something else here that came out of that first equation, that lambda equals 1. Now, if I try and plug lambda equals 1 into here, it does nothing for me. There's no lambdas, but I can plug that into this one, okay? In which case, I'm going to get that... Um, 4y equals 2y. And if I subtract this to the other side, I'm going to get 2y equals 0, in which case y equals 0. All right. So this lambda gave me this y value, but I still need the x. So I have to get the x by then plugging this into this third equation. I can't go back to the original equation, one, because there's no y's there, but also because I started there. Right? You never want to take something that you got and plug it back into the equation that it came from. So this gave me this, and I don't want to go back to where this came from. I want to go to the somewhere else where I only have one more place to go, which is this equation here. So what I have is um, if, say, y equals 0 using this x squared plus y squared equals 1, then you're going to see that x squared equals 1 and therefore x equals plus and minus 1, and we're going to get 1, 0, and negative 1, 0. And we got two more critical points. All right, so we have four critical points total, and that's all we're going to be able to find. Um, if you wanted to, we could have started with this equation here, and I could have done the same thing I did with the original equation. I could have set it equal to 0, and then found y in lambda, and it would have just circled me back to these same four points. Now what we want to do is we want to find f of 0, 1, f of 0, negative 1, f of 1, 0, and f of negative 1, 0. And here's f. So when I plug these into there, I'm going to get 2, 2, 1, and 1. 
You see, these give me the same z value again. It's just a coincidence. We happen to get two maxes again. And we actually get two mins. If one of these was higher than the other, then we would only have one max. Whichever one is the highest one, that would be the absolute max. But since these have the same z values, in this case, there's two of them that are the same max. We could have three, four, five different maxes as long as they all reach the exact same highest point. But in this case, we have two and two. Coincidence with the two examples, that's not always going to happen. Oftentimes, you get one max, one min. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, um, we have two maxes and two mins here. And then that's it. I mean, we th these are the two absolute maximums, and these would be the two absolute minimums. And you should really write these probably as the points. So we would say the maxes are 0, 1, 2, and 0, negative 1, 2. And the mins are uh, 1, 0, 1, and negative 1, 0, 1. Okay. But that would be it. And notice, in this case, what we did in the first one didn't really work. But here's a scenario that you could try as an alternative. Set this first equation equal to 0. Solve for whatever variables are there. In this case, I got two of them by factoring. And then take those variables and sub them into the other equations to try and whittle it down to find what x's and y solve the system. All right, here's one more. Now, this one we took a little step up, and we're going to put more variables into this. So now I have a function of three variables. My constraint curve is a curve in the x, is a plane, sorry, it's a surface, but in this case a plane, um, in x, y, and z. Uh, so the number of variables here, uh, this constraint curve, is always going to be one less than the total number of variables here. Remember, this looks like it has three, but really it's four, because f was basically our w. Right? We say that's w equals this x, y, and z uh, surface in 4D. But the fact that this happened in 4D doesn't really matter. We're trying to do the same thing. Now, what we want is we want the gradient of f to equal lambda times the gradient of g. But the gradient of f has fx, fy, and now fz. And the gradient of g has gx, gy, and gz. So we want fx to be equal to lambda gx, fy equal to lambda gy, fz equal to lambda gz. But remember, we always want to stay on that constraint curve the whole time as well. So we want to make sure we always stick to this constraint as one of our equations. And so now this is the system that we need to solve. So it's four equations, but it's also four variables, x, y, z, and lambda. So we always want to make sure our number of variables and our number of equations uh, equals, uh, which will help us find a, a solution much better. All right, so anyway, here's our system. So fx, fx would be 4x. That's going to be equal to lambda times gx, which would be just be 2. Fy, which is going to be 2y, is going to be equal to lambda times gy, which will just be minus 3. And fz is going to be 6z, which is going to equal to uh, lambda gz. Remember, this is g. gz, which will be negative 4. I should put parentheses around that. Okay. And our constraint curve, again, is just that equation. So there's our system. Okay, I should write it 2x minus 3y minus 4z equals negative 49. All right, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and solve these for lambda, just like before. I always try to do that first and see if it works out. Well, this is easy. It's going to give me lambda equals um, 2x. Lambda equals negative two thirds y, and lambda equals um, uh, what's that going to be? Negative three halves z. Well, all these are the same lambda, so that means all these have to equal each other. So that means two x has to equal uh, negative two thirds y has to equal negative three halves z. And remember, we also have to be in here. So what we're going to do this is we're going to say, all right, well, I'm going to say these two are equal to each other. 
And in which case, if 2x equals negative 3 halves z, then I could say that z equals negative 4 thirds x. And if I say these two are also equal to each other, that 2x equals negative 2 thirds y, then I could say that y equals uh, negative 3x, okay, flip and multiply. And so if I take those and I plug both of those into this equation, I have an equation that just has a bunch of x's in it. So I get 2x minus 3 times y, which is negative 3x, minus 4 times z, which is negative 4 thirds x, and that is to equal 49. So what do I get here? I got 2x plus 9x minus 16 thirds x equals 49. So this is what, 11, that's going to be what, 33 thirds x minus 16 thirds x equals 49. And so what do you get there? Uh, so there's a mistake here. This should be plus 16 because it's negative, negative. So that's plus 16. Um, and so that gives me 49 thirds x equals 49. So flip and multiply, you end up with x equals 3. All right, so we got an x. Now that we have an x, what do we need to do? We need to find a y. And we also need to find a z. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to here. So if we have an x, we can figure out what y is. If we have an x, we can figure out what z is. So remember, x equals 3, and we know that negative 4 thirds x equals z. And we also know that negative 3x equals y. So this is going to tell me if I plug x in here and x in here, I'm going to get that negative 4 equals z and negative 9 equals y. And so I have the point 3, negative 9, negative 4 as my critical point. But that's the only one, right? I didn't get an x value to yield multiple z's or multiple y's, and I didn't get multiple x's either. So I got 1x, 1y, 1z. That's it. I get this one point. And so if I have to then plug that back into the function, right? if you plug this back into the function, which was 2x squared plus y squared plus 3z squared, I would get f of 3, negative 9, uh, negative 4. So that would be... 2 times 9 plus uh, 81 plus 3 times 16, so 18 plus 81 plus, what's that, 48? No, not 48. Yeah, 48, 48. Um, so 48 plus 81 plus, what was that, 18, gives me 147. All right. But it's the only Z value, in this case, sorry, W value, right? This is the only W value I can find. So that's the only surface value I can, I can find, and I can't compare it to anything. So how do I know if this is a max or a min? Well, this is the other reason why this example is here, is to say that, well, how do we do this? If I had two different points to plug into the surface, I could look at the two different W values and see which one's bigger and which one's smaller. And I could say, okay, this one's bigger, therefore it's a max. This one's smaller, therefore it's the min. But when there's only one, there's nothing to compare it to. So how do I know if this is a max, if this is the biggest, or this is the smallest? Now, there's a couple ways we can go about this. One is we can try and look at the surface in relationship to the constraint curve graphically, which is not going to be easy to do in this case because this is happening in four dimensions, and try and decide whether or not we moved higher up on the surface or lower up on the surface and reach the maximum. 
If this is 3D instead of 4D, that might be a little bit more doable, um, but still not easy, right? I mean, graphing these random surfaces will not be easy unless you have a computer software to do it. Um, so the other option is to say, well, it doesn't really matter, okay? That what we have here is at this point, 3, negative 9, negative 4, 147, is the only extreme value. And it doesn't really matter if it's a max or a min. It's essentially what we were looking for, right? We're, and, and whether it's a max or min is really relative to how you look at the surface. If you look at a surface that's maybe shaped like this, okay, you have a maximum, but if you look at it from a different perspective, say look at it upside down, that same point could also be a minimum. So how you look at a surface and what your perspective is of the surface, you know, can change what extreme value you have. But the fact that this is the only one is really what's most important. So if we were looking for a max, then there's a max. If we were looking for a min, then it's a min. Um, and, and so ultimately, it really does not matter which one this is because there's nothing to distinguish it from anything else. If we had multiple points, then it matters, right? We got to figure out, okay, this one itself is the max and this one is the min because there are multiple extreme values and we need to know which one is which. But when there's only one, you know, it, it ultimately doesn't matter. And that sounds like a cop out, but it, it's just the truth uh, that, that this doesn't really necessarily matter what type of extreme value is since it's the only one. And so the point of this question was not really the fact that there was all these extra variables, right? There's an extra Z here, and we had four equations um, and four unknowns. The real point is this final piece, which is if you only get one value to plug into the function, you find the function value. Since you have nothing to compare it to, because there are no other points to find their corresponding function values, then how do you know what you have? And the point here that I'm trying to make is that it doesn't really matter, okay? The fact that it's the only one is the really important part here.